Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Paymar, and you are listening to The Big Shift, the podcast that looks at the massive changes our country and the world are confronting. Most foreign policy experts agree the most important geopolitical issue of our time beyond the Russian invasion into Ukraine is America's relationship with China. America and China are the world's two largest economies by far. They are the top emitters of greenhouse gases, the cause of global warming and extreme weather events. The two nations also spend more on their militaries than any other country. For several decades, America and China became economically interdependent. But in 2018, former President Trump imposed hundreds of billions of dollars of tariffs on China, citing unfair trade practices and intellectual property theft by China. The Biden administration has kept the tariffs intact. China's military expansion in the South Pacific has pushed the two nations into an arms buildup, a rivalry that threatens the world order. Without the two most powerful nations cooperating, collaborating, and coordinating, there is the prospect of conflict. We are joined today by Dr. May Getchlet, a China law and policy expert, founder and CEO at Sinotalks, and former director of Stanford University's China Guiding Cases Project. We're going to discuss how we might avoid future tension and work toward finding solutions to our shared global challenges. May, thanks so much for joining us today on The Big Shift. Thanks very much, Jim, for having me. May was born in Hong Kong, but has had extensive experience in China, observing court trials and interviewing judges to complete her Stanford doctorate on judicial reform in China. Apart from law degrees from Hong Kong and Stanford, she also has an MBA from the Wharton School of Business at UPenn. She is widely recognized as one of the world's leading Chinese-American legal scholars. Quite a background, May. That's very kind introduction, Jim. Well, the first question I'd like to ask you, May, in your view, do you see a pathway for America and China to reverse course from this current rivalry, from building up our militaries, tension over the Taiwan issue, conflicts over trade, and find a way to work together to solve global problems? Of course. In fact, uh, just go back to the basic principle. By minimizing disagreement, focus on the issues that the two countries can work together and leave the tough issues to be dealt with later when both countries have better understanding of each other's needs and interests. And in my opinion, there are at least three issues that the two countries can focus on, economy, climate, and conflict. We don't seem to be making a whole lot of progress, especially in the last few years. One thing I'd like to discuss with you are China's current economic problems, including youth unemployment, consumer spending, slowing GDP, and a severely weakened real estate market. Those are causing some serious economic downturns in China, and that has uh, some serious implications for our global financial system. First of all, Jim, I would like to mention that uh, the Chinese ambassador to the United States would actually disagree with you because Ah. recently recently he just published uh, uh, an article in a major newspaper saying that China's economy is not as bad as most people think. Mm -hmm. He um, referred to data uh, reported by IMF and explained that the GDP growth in China ranges around from five to six. Mm -hmm. And then overall, he emphasized that we still have quite significant uh, export because well, China still takes up more than 14% of the world's uh, export market, particularly in the areas related to electric vehicles, solar cells. Mm-hmm. And one more thing is actually he emphasized that we still have a lot of investment countries from Europe, like France, Britain, Germany. And then in addition to that, Japan, they're coming back. So then they actually, well, he painted more optimistic picture. But GDP growth was a few years back was 10, 11 percent, not 5 or 6 percent. And that's the reason why by Chinese standards, it's still not good enough, even though it's not that bad. And right. one more one more in, 
important thing is actually, I think that's the reason why we need to focus on the details. The ambassador actually also explained that most of the GDP growth actually related to consumption. Like uh -huh. uh, he would actually refer to uh, the more Chinese people, like uh, uh, no, over 500 million Chinese people going to see movies in the summer and outnumber the total American population. But, you know, the focus on consumption mm -hmm. would not be sufficient. We, we still need to actually, I agree with you, we still need to actually do more to improve the economy. There's still a need for U.S. companies to go in. For example, China's middle income group have about right now is more than 400, 400 million mm -hmm. and it's expected to grow to, to double uh, to more than 800 million by 2035. Now, yeah. with that with that in mind, then that means that while these people will be significant consumers, and that's a good reminder that we need to encourage more trade and investment. Uh, May, in, in Sinotalks, in one of your recent articles, you, you posed the question, is there a chance for private enterprise to win a lawsuit against a state-owned enterprise or a government agency in China. Now, that's really important for U.S. and European corporations if they want to invest in China. My reading of it is the Supreme People's Court of China has signaled a very positive response to that. Why is this so important? In fact, that's actually a remarkable moment for the Supreme People's Court to actually signal that. There's a reason, because recently, uh, a few weeks ago, the top Chinese leadership issue a significant document to reaffirm the value of private enterprises. Because we still actually remember that there had been a lot of discussions whether private enterprises, their legal rights and interests are protected, mm -hmm. or whether actually legal rights and interests of state-owned enterprises and government agencies are more important than private enterprises. So then the document signal that, no, let's get it straight. Uh, we are reaffirming the value of private enterprises. And then with that high level document, then of course, other branches of the government, including the court system, had to take some actions to validate that statement. And that's the reason why the Supreme People's Court issued these two representative cases to indicate. And then in those two cases, private enterprises won the lawsuit against the state-owned enterprises. And so if you're a General Electric or General Motors, and you know that you can go into China and you can invest, and if there is a legal problem, you can get some kind of justice within the Chinese system. That, that's got to be very important for U.S. companies. Yes. In fact, that's why um, the, the, the signal issue by the Supreme People's Court through the release of these cases is to boost confidence in the Chinese market. But I, mm -hmm. I also want to be fair. It's not just like today that there's a chance for foreign companies, private companies to win lawsuits there. There are actually many other cases already indicate that, well, there's a chance for foreign companies and for private enterprises to win lawsuits. But the most important thing is actually, it's not just possibility, it's actually probability. How likely does it take place? And that's actually the, right now the most important in order to actually boost foreign investors' confidence. Well, there's still actually a chance and also make sure that everything is transparent. Mm -hmm. So then there, they can actually have a chance to see how previous cases were handled. And then there's predictability and certainty. It can't be opaque. It has to be transparent. You've, you've got to know when you're a, a corporation trying to invest maybe billions of dollars that you can make sure that you've got honesty and integrity and that you've got a court you can go to and engage with if you need to. One thing I'd like to touch on, four major American officials have recently paid visits to China. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, former 
Secretary of State John Kerry, Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen, and U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. This is all in an effort to normalize relations after, uh, what I guess I would refer to it as saber rattling, and after the spy balloon that was sent over America, it appears that China and America are trying to re-engage in dialogue and find a way to resolve differences. Your view? Yes, absolutely. This is a very good sign, and in fact,、uh, we should congratulate both sides to actually calm down a little bit to restore dialogues. In fact, from my own opinion, what you cannot have understanding unless you have a chance to meet to have a dialogue. It's very important to have conversation. It's in. Important for these leaders of both countries to get together to resolve issues. Now, why haven't major Chinese political officials come to visit the U.S. like we are going over there? It, it seems like these current efforts indicate America has a desire to revive China's industrial economy, while China expands into other parts of the world with its Belt and Road Initiative and moving trade into countries that the U.S. is not focused on particularly. Like Africa and Latin America,、uh, what's your viewpoint on that? I think if、uh, there is actually a stronger basis、uh, to get rid of misunderstanding, while、well, the Chinese、uh, side will feel more ready and welcome to come to the United States and have more constructive dialogue. That doesn't actually negate the opportunity to communicate better. While、well, two countries' representatives attend international events, and that's why actually we need to actually well provide more opportunities to make sure that they can still continue the dialogue, not necessarily、mm-hmm. inside China or inside the United States, but elsewhere. So then, for example, while、well, coming up, we will have multiple occasions for、uh, these two countries' representatives to meet. And in fact, actually in August,、uh, while、well, Saudi Arabia actually hosts To talks to talked about the conflicts in Ukraine. Well,、mm-hmm. it's notable that actually dozens of countries showed up, including. Representatives from China and also、mm-hmm. from the United States, and you can see that there's actually signal that while platform still available, it's just a matter of time to actually make both sides feel more comfortable to have meaningful discussions. We've got to stop this、uh, tit for tat, this、uh, saber rattling, the、uh, conflict over competition,、uh, and, and somehow figure out a way of working together. There have been moves toward what we call onshoring of manufacturing. Manufacturing from China back to the U.S. so that we are not so dependent on China for the products we consume, and also to reduce our enormous trade deficit with China. Statistics from 2022 indicate the U.S. trade deficit with China was 383 billion dollars, one of the largest in history. At the same time, though, May, there are studies that indicate that while trade has slowed, we are still buying Chinese products through third countries. So, are we really resolving any problems, or just creating new supply chains? Indeed, actually, why I noticed that kind of report, and that's the reason why it actually proves the point you you made at the very beginning of the show. Well, the two economies they actually really actually show interdependency. They cannot completely be independent of each other. So that's、mm-hmm. why, even though you may take actions to stop, but then, well, creative entrepreneurs and businessmen they could always actually find solutions to avoid the problems. And so, so that's the reason why.、I、go back to the point: we still economy trade is actually important. That the two countries understand that they have to actually rely on each other. Then more and more people will get the benefits. And I think actually at this point, I think we. We should also、uh, go back to other potential issues that the two countries can work together to advance their understanding. If China is exporting product to places like Mexico or Vietnam or Brazil, and then we are purchasing those same products. That were made in China. We haven't really reduced the trade deficit. We've just taken it down another highway. Absolutely, and that's the reason why I I honestly believe it. And that's the data that I just show. I I, I just、uh, share with you is that actually well, China's market, well, the middle income group is rising, and these people eventually will be because they will have the money, and also they look for more high quality products from the West, including、mm-hmm. the United States. And then so no matter what the trade. 
deficit problem, we need to address them by actually thinking about how to actually export more products from the United States and high high value ones to the Chinese market. And that's why don't just look at current situation. Look at the prospect. Well, years、mm-hmm. from now, technology and intellectual property issues are also critical to our mutual futures. There have been long-standing concerns about China stealing intellectual property, forced technology transfers, and, and cybersecurity issues. Now, the U.S. has accused China of engaging in unfair trade practices that harm American businesses and compromise national security. But we also have blocked Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE from operating in the U.S. The ban on these Chinese companies is said to have had a significant impact on the U.S. economy, making it difficult for U.S. companies to、uh, do business with China. Your view on how this trade conflict is impacting the business environment in both the U.S. and China? Having been in Silicon Valley for so many years, of course, I understand that how important the issue is about technology and protection of the intellectual property rights. Well, according to our, our, our think tank in Australia, their independent study illustrate that because they track 51 critical technology, and then they, according to the finding, is actually well, China actually has. Global lead in most of these fifty-one critical technologies, and、mm-hmm. these critical technologies cover a wide range of areas. And but like, like, like for example, okay, energy and environment, AI, computing, biotech, all of these ca- three categories, China has taken global lead. Now the point I try to make is because a lot of people came to talk to me, say that they're very concerned about IP theft. I understand, but. Wait, wait a second. If all the technologies, but they always claim that it's too easy for them to say that all technologies China actually has actually stolen from、mm-hmm. United States or other Western countries. But if this is the case, how come United States is not having the glo- global lead in those critical technologies right now? While China is taking the lead, then well, let's stop there. What I try to say, assuming that China really actually stole a lot of technologies, but then one important point is how. How China actually have the capacity to build on the stolen? If that actually、mm-hmm. happened, the stolen technology, and then take it to another level, and、mm-hmm. so advanced that while、well, China is now taking the lead, now where is the capacity coming from? It's actually it must be within the country. They have the talent, the human capital to be able to actually t- do the research and development to improve the technology to a significant level. The point I try to say is definitely intellectual property protection. We need to deal with that. But at the same time,、mm-hmm. we also well should not just attribute all the problems to one single factor of theft. We also need to look about how well United States need to make sure that we don't lose our competitive edge. To make sure that education continues to be rigorous, to actually have the talent while improving the technology in the United States. Let's move on from there for a moment. China has pushed to expand what is known as the BRICS Economic Alliance. That Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa—they were the original members. But recently, Argentina, Iran, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates have all recently agreed to join this economic bloc, which is now known as BRICS Plus. Is this an effort to be a counterweight against American and Western European power?、Uh, how do you view that development? First of all, I want to actually—it may be very important to actually notice that the membership. Of these new members, what、well, they are right now still official, still just well, having the invitations from BRICS. Well, the well, they still actually need to go through a process before the membership will be fil- finalized on January first, two thousand twenty-four. But no matter what, well, we expect that this will happen. So one thing I would say that is, given the geopolitical situation in the world, of course, it's natural for any country to make sure that they have as many friends as possible. Because、right. so then, well, let's. Actually, just take that back. If we、well, put ourselves in the position of、uh, China, of course, they act, the government actually really need to make sure that they can actually have more friends through global south. Seem to actually be able to、uh, support China's、uh, gold agenda. 
and the parties. For example, China will focus actually more on helping these、uh, poorer countries to address the poverty issue, and then to actually、uh, help them develop, especially actually、uh, healthcare. According to、uh, another independent institute's research, I actually I'm actually pleasantly surprised that China's in terms of healthcare well, is ranked number five in the world. Really? Yes. Really. <laughs> so imagine that. Well, Jim, yeah. Imagine you you actually belong to the global south, and the party is actually. Of course, improve economy and make sure that no poverty issues, no healthcare problems. And then,、mm-hmm. how can you not welcome a country that can actually provide that kind of support? So, and so this is actually very interesting. And one thing actually we should note is actually, of course, these six new members they carefully pick and then notable to actually say that Saudi Arabia, UAE, these are actually traditional oil powers, but they themselves also want to diversify the economy. The economy Right. And also、right. uh, increase the political influence in the world.、So、What I found very interesting about that is that both Iran and Saudi Arabia, who are enemies in the Arab world, agreed to be part of an economic bloc. Then isn't it actually very telling? Just go back to the basic principle: focus on issues that we can collaborate and、mm-hmm. then deal with the tough issues later. So、uh, the fact that China actually broke the agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Arabia indicate that much can be done through、mm-hmm. dialogue and peaceful discussion, and even well, this is actually very inspiring when we look at these two countries with so many conflicts, and yet they can now sit together to address、uh, issues that are they identify as having top priorities. Yeah, that are in common, that they have common、yes. issues, and they need to resolve certain problems, and and that all makes sense. Both China and America seem to be engaging. And kind of a shadow Cold War. China is building up its military capacity in the South China Sea. The U.S. is flexing its military muscle in the Pacific. China and Russia seem to be pushing for a closer alliance, and China is buying Russian oil despite the sanctions most nations are adhering to after Russia's aggressive attempt to obliterate Ukraine as a nation. It seems that China has a two-pronged strategic policy: one with the West. And one with Russia is that the case? I believe that they have. Well, for China, they have to understand that they that the number the first part is always to make sure that they have more. More friends instead of enemies. And one thing, for example, actually with respect to Russia, China always actually say that it's actually time to resolve the conflict in Ukraine by having a dialogue, by actually having peaceful discussion. And in fact, to be honest, I think right now, after so many months, we can actually see that the counteroffensive approach doesn't seem to work. Then、mm-hmm. perhaps the challenge. Facing the West is how to bring the parties to the negotiation to the negotiation table without letting Russia smell any weakness in the West. So、mm-hmm. I think that's actually、uh, a very pragmatic、uh, issue. Well, that we need to actually deal with if this actually conflict drags on. I think well the. The the main losers are ordinary people in Ukraine, so we don't want to see that. I guess China and Russia have had、uh, a mutual alliance that dates back quite a long time, going back to the Korean War era, to the Vietnam War era. They have worked together in the past, so you could see how they would work together now. But let's turn to another issue, Taiwan,、mm. which is always front and center. The People's Republic of China views the island of Taiwan as a renegade province and vows to eventually unify it with the mainland. Now, Taiwan has been governed independently of mainland China since the Communist Revolution in 1949. Taiwan strongly objects to China's sovereignty claims, and the U.S. does not have a formal treaty obligation to protect Taiwan, but it does have a long-standing policy of of quote unquote strategic ambiguity towards <laughs> ta- Taiwan, meaning that the U.S. has not explicitly stated whether or not it, it would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese attack. Do you see a Chinese attack on Taiwan as a distinct possibility, and what response might come from the U.S.? First of all, I actually see that 
With respect to Taiwan, China always take it as internal issue, and then、mm -hmm. they will always show resistance of even talking about it. And then, and this is actually well why we say that when we actually focus on the easy issues that the two countries can work on first, and then leave、mm -hmm. for those tough issue for later. And Taiwan is one of the toughest issues、mm -hmm. um, between the two countries. However, I also want to emphasize one thing is actually well what I actually. Reassure the Chinese side. Focus on the people in Taiwan. What they think. What the mainstream views are.、Mm -hmm. According to an ongoing survey conducted by a university in Taiwan from 1994 to even June 2023, consistently, well, there's actually more than 50 percent of the respondents. Adopt the stance that is to maintain status quo.、Mm -hmm. If that's the case, well, it's actually well, and then and then deal with this issue later. Everyone actually, I, I think right now we don't have enough to actually handle. From for example, from PR's point of view, they can see that they don't have enough. Well, people support to actually talk about reunification as a very risky step for them. And if they start to well look at the Ukraine conflict, I don't think that they they want to take the step to have any conflict across、mm -hmm. the Taiwan Strait. So that's the reason why. Well, I personally have、uh, done something to actually communicate with the Taiwan side. Well, I met with the judges there, and then too,、mm -hmm. interestingly, Jim. In fact, well, well, there's actually one type of case that's very remarkable in China with de facto binding effect, in effect binding. Of what these are called guiding cases. You know where the idea is from? It's from Taiwan.、Where? Okay.、So、you can. Well, the the point I try to make is actually bring the two systems, bring the two. Well, the people in Taiwan. Want people in mainland China closer to actually understand each other, and let's just wait and see what can be done later. Well, the U.S. has sold billions of dollars worth of arms to Taiwan over the years to deter China from attacking, and the U.S. also maintains a powerful military presence in the region. In recent years, the U.S. has become more vocal in its support for Taiwan. President Biden said the U.S. would come to Taiwan's defense if China attacked, and the U.S., Japan, and South Korea recently held a trilateral summit, and the three countries agreed to deepen cooperation on a number. Of issues, including security, because they perceive a growing threat from China. Now, this cannot sit very well in Beijing with President Xi. And military alliances in our history have often led to war. Thoughts on that? Well, certainly. In fact, well,、um, this from China's point of view, of course, is actually provocative. Do we want that? In fact, this is like, interesting. The alliance between United States, Japan, and South Korea tend to be so strong, but seem to be quite strong to the extent that now, recently, when Japan actually released treated radioactive water from Fukushima power plant, well, notice、mm -hmm. one thing: so, South Koreans didn't say anything. And Taiwan didn't say anything, even though they are directly affected. Okay, but China absolutely, did. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and then you can see that. Well, and, and that's why actually, if you if you if you notice that the uh, uh, the、um, opinion expressed by Chinese people, wait. Well, South Koreans and Taiwan, you guys actually are directly affected, adversely affected by、uh, the water. Given geopolitics, you can't even say a word, and that's actually doesn't sit no、mm -hmm. well. But、mm -hmm. no matter what, go back to this point is actually it's understandable. But why United States and Japan, South Korea, form such an alliance? But also, but they also need to understand you are actually provoking China because、mm -hmm. from that point of view. Taiwan is well so important to them that it's not actually subject to discussion. Well, perhaps we should actually really step back a little bit and、mm -hmm. and focus on the issues theme. Focus on economy. Focus on climate. Focus on the conflict. In Ukraine, and see how that whether that may be a better time to consider the Taiwan issue. I, I find it very interesting because there, there's been such animosity between Japan and South Korea because of the occupation of Korea by Japan for decades until the end of World War II, and then you had this horrific war between Japan and China during World War II, and now you see South Korea. 
and Japan and the United States forming an alliance, that, that has to be very threatening to China. Absolutely. Well, then it says one thing is actually in terms of international politics, there are always actually, this is always the point, no country is actually uh, an enemy all the time or no country is a friend all the time. It's actually well, how you prioritize your issues, your interests. Mm-hmm. So, but then the actual, that sounds actually quite pessimistic, but on the other hand, no. That sounds, to me, that's optimistic. That means everyone needs to be pragmatic to address the imminent issue. Mm-hmm. Put a stop to the conflict before it happens. May, looking in the rearview mirror, and I, I would imagine that this subject is near and dear to your heart. Hong Kong was returned to China in 1997, ending 156 years of British rule. And the handover was agreed upon in the Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984. Now, that declaration stated that Hong Kong's economic and social systems would remain relatively unchanged for 50 years. Of course, that was not the case. And, and Beijing now has more or less absolute control over Hong Kong. What is the future like for the people of Hong Kong and And if I was a Taiwanese leader, I would be very wary of any reunification agreement. This is a very, very important issue. Let me provide the context. From 1994 to 1998, I was actually a tenure law professor. Uh, I was a a law professor in Hong Kong teaching secretly constitutional law issues arising from the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Indeed, well, if you ask the Hong Kong government and also the mainland Chinese government, then they will actually still say that the well, promise was well, stated in the joint declaration still exists. That's a such a high degree of autonomy in Hong Kong. Everything remain one country, two systems remain unchanged for 50 years. Mm-hmm. However, how, however, we actually do notice that from 2019 to COVID, there were more concerns and then, well, a lot large-scale protests happened. And as a result, to make the long story short, I don't need to repeat all the instances. Uh, indeed, actually, many Hong Kong people have already left to, mm-hmm. well, to uh, emigrate to other countries. However, something very interesting recently, you will imagine that well, such a, it seems like the city should have, seems to have a lot of anti uh China sentiment. But recently, right. uh, according to studies, well, a lot of businesses, restaurants in Hong Kong complained about not having consumers, customers. Why? Mm-hmm. Because many of them actually crossed the border during weekends to actually spend in Shenzhen, the high-tech hub in mainland China, the city that's close is Hong Kong. But one thing that's actually interesting, one then, well, interviewed Hong Kong people always say that because the service better, the, uh, the environment is better, and then people are friendlier. And then and this is actually a note for our reference. What does it mean that this is a step, the beginning of deeper understanding between the people in Hong Kong and mainland China? And it's actually worth noting that this uh, may be something we need to remember. A lot of actual Hong Kong people, well, even though I'm originally from Hong Kong, but I started very early to study uh, the language in Mandarin mm-hmm. and also mm-hmm. to study the legal system there. But uh, not many people in Hong Kong really have deep understanding the situation in mainland China. But when you find significant business leaders fleeing Hong Kong because they don't think it's a great place to do business anymore, that's got to hurt uh, the Hong Kong economy. Significant uh, business leaders, well, like Li Kaxing, all of these top leaders in the city, they still stay in Hong Kong. What we don't know is actually, uh, what, according to different sources, most people who have chosen to who have chosen to leave are more like professionals and of course mm-hmm. expatriates like the Americans who used to actually work in the financial district in Hong Kong, right? And right. Then, yes. But major companies, these actually business leaders, they still actually, well, according to their open remarks, they're still optimistic about the opportunity in Hong Kong with particular focus on the opportunities arising from Hong Kong's proximity with the Guangdong province, well, which is the province that actually is closest to Hong Kong. And then they have what they call, well, China call the, the Greater Bay Area. 
okay mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. well nine cities actually well including macau and hong kong they actually have close economic relationship and uh, so different people have different tech but right now well to be sure because i recently went back uh, during the summer to see what's going on um is more quiet okay it's mm -hmm. not as mm -hmm. crowded as before and mm -hmm. the, uh, in general there's actually some uh, pessimism but um well is it actually well well like a versus a few years ago when there were a lot of protests at least it's more peaceful and people do not need to worry about going to subway and then there may be attacks okay or maybe protests inside so then um there's more actual public order now and but more public order but the dissent is underground uh, yes. the, the chinese have made it quite clear that if you are protesting that you could very well end up in jail and that's why lose, I, your, lose your job and that's why it goes back to the point you mentioned why they would take this step why Beijing would take this step, such a strong measure in Hong Kong. Isn't it true that Hong Kong should be used as example to illustrate the success of one country, two systems, a model that they want to use to demonstrate that it would work. And then, then similarly, the Taiwan issue could be handled in the same way by using one country, two systems model, right? So then... Isn't the leadership now in Hong Kong basically subservient to Beijing? In a way, that's actually some concern about that but of course well they would say that in we, we still have high degree of autonomy but i i would say that in a way the general public they have no interest in m m many people i i have to be very careful with the remarks because many uh many people would actually think that um there's no real democracy in hong kong as a result they don't feel the need to really actually cast the votes in elections because in the past they still think that well there there are actually a sufficient number of candidates from all different alliances and then so now it's actually more pro-Beijing alliance representatives. So indeed there has been some concern about the democratic development um, going backward. Mm -hmm. But talked about the judiciary in Hong Kong, and no matter what, we have to actually recognize that the Hong Kong judges are still very well trained and because everything is actually transparent. How can you not produce well-reasoned well, judgments, right? So, right. because they have their personal reputation to protect as well. So let's actually keep our fingers, fingers crossed. Let, let, let's switch gears because you mentioned a while ago uh, climate change, and I did want to get to that. Now, we've we've seen h horrific results of global warming devastating our planet from the fires in Maui recently, Canada, California, and Greece to killer floods in China, Europe, and India. We see uh, coastal areas being inundated during hurricane and typhoon seasons. China and the U.S. are the largest emitters of greenhouse gases. And according to the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, China opened the equivalent of adding 17 new coal-fired power plants each month in the year 2021. And it's also unclear how the U.S. is going to decrease our dependence on oil, gas, and coal. Your, your thoughts on both countries' efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? They have 1.4 billion people and right. that actually represents nearly 20% of the world's population. But, well, according to uh, uh, the official data, China as a whole only has 9% of the world's arable land. So for mm -hmm. China, this is real. They don't have enough land to actually support. Well, they, they, they are under more pressure to make sure that well, the environment allows them to feed well, that large population and that's why I actually step back is that well they well they, they really actually very keen on protecting the environment because it's mm -hmm. related to food etc so food security is number one, is a very very top priority issue and then actually this relates to another thing is actually for example um china actually has a very actually well drafted uh law it's called seeds law meaning that they have a mechanism to protect well, the invention of high yielding seeds. 
So then, well, these seeds can be planted without using a lot of agricultural input, but still produce a lot of food because otherwise that will be very damaging to the environment. I know China is a, a leader in solar production and also in they're very heavily into wind production, but they still continue to uh, build these uh, coal-fired power plants to make sure that their industrial base moves forward. So how do we resolve those issues? Like you talked about, 1.4 billion people, that's a lot of people to and there's desertification going on in much of China, where the arable land is is drying up and turning into desert. China can't afford that. Absolutely. And that's why, actually, it's very important to actually, they, they always actually say that they are still on track to accomplish a sustainable environment goal well, that they promised in various international documents. And then, well, this is actually one thing on the, well, how they will balance these, these on the one hand, they need to actually have the energy because uh, to fuel the economic development. But on the other hand, they need to actually worry about well, well, how to maintain a very clean environment to sustain the food production. So that's why actually recently I invited a top scholar from Central Party School, which is actually the think tank of the ruling party in China, to talk about, well, uh, these issues. He particularly identified that climate development issues are, well, these are the top issue recognized by the Chinese ruling party. So let's hope that they will actually keep it as top priority and balance all these seem to be actually self-defeating well, initiatives, how to balance energy shortage versus protection of the environment. So we should actually really keep track on that. And China is also a leader in uh, electric vehicles. And in fact, actually, not only that, they actually export those uh, electric vehicles uh, to other countries. Like, for example, according to my recent research, UAE, uh, United Arab Emirates, suggest actually approve very important license to a Chinese company to actually have to test the self-driving electric cars mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, one thing is actually um, for sure, look, uh, looking at uh, the production, the products that they produce, they're indeed heading toward a uh, clean energy, green tech. And, mm -hmm. and that's why actually I, I just uh, refer to the data our well, well, they are actually in terms of energy and environment critical technology. China has the global lead. So uh, at what point they will actually s slow down the, com the uh, use of coal? Exactly. I, I was about yeah. to say that. Thank you. Right. To actually really actually let all these green tech and climate friendly technologies go beyond that. So well, if China if China can figure that out, they'll be able to sell that into the global economy. That's a no brainer. You know, some political experts believe that China is also in a position of power and influence right now to help end the war in Ukraine, which we talked about briefly, which is causing global energy and food instability. Now, if China wasn't buying huge amounts of Russian oil and gas, might, in your view, do you think Moscow might find itself more willing to negotiate a peaceful end of the war? However, China has chosen to deepen its ties with the Russians. Is there a way to bring China around to be an arbiter of a negotiated peace settlement in Ukraine? But Jim, as far as I know, actually, Russia and China, they have indicated some willingness to start negotiation. Well, what is actually hindering the process is actually not Russia, not China, but actually Ukraine itself. So that's the reason why we need to actually help Ukraine understand that the ongoing counter-offensive approach is not working and then but you know well it's very hard but like recently some representatives from the west when they openly make remarks suggesting that perhaps you should actually give up something in order to actually bring all the parties to negotiation table now how we can actually skillfully suggest that to ukraine without sounding weak that's the point that's the challenge yeah. one other subject i 
I'd like to touch on is, is Xi Jinping. He's been president of the People's Republic of China since 2013. He's also the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party and chairman of the Central Military Commission, basically giving him absolute power over the state. Some political experts expect him to be in power well into the future since he removed term limits for the presidency that allows him to potentially remain in power indefinitely. His father was one of the country's revolutionary leaders. Are Xi's politics more in line with the hardcore communist leanings of Mao Zedong or the economic reformer Deng Xiaoping, who helped open China to the world? If you ask most uh, Chinese people, well, they would see that it's very confusing for them because uh, Xi Jinping's father has been considered to be very moderate, very mo- open-minded. And then, um, and that's the reason why when Xi came to power, everyone actually hoped that he would be inspired by his father to actually choose that path. Past years' um, experience, development seem to indicate that that's not necessarily the case. Well, and that is very hard for mainland China Chinese people, especially intellectuals who actually have some res- well, have problems with the amendment to the Chinese constitution in 2018, that actually, according, well, just like what you mentioned, that removed the restrictions on the term of the president. So in theory, yes, now there's actually no term limit for President Xi to stay to stay in this position to actually keep the power. People actually try to justify that because uh, this is actually well something that they don't want to see. Is actually they think that this is actually going backward. They try to justify it. Could that be because because I have talked to many intellectuals? Could that be because they think that well, well, real leaders they you you need more time to finish your important business and you strongly believe that this is the right path for the country. And so as a result, well, he had to take this uh, step to amend the constitution to allow him to stay in power. One particular positive trend is that indeed, actually, during this presidency, there's actually a lot of uh, Mm anti-corruption actions taking place. And then as a result, well, corruption is not as uh, significant. And then more leaders are held accountable and punished and sent to jail. Now, this is actually very similar to Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao. Uh, Jim, I don't mm-hmm. know whether you had the opportunity to talk to taxi drivers in Beijing, mainland China. They always like to say that, well, fair, we missed the time during the, during the Chairman Mao era because even though we were poor, but at least everyone was poor. No one was corrupt. However, um, then they actually, well, um, they compare with Deng Xiaoping, then they say, well, yeah, some people actually had the opportunity to become rich first, because this is actually the well-known statement made by uh, Deng Xiaoping. Okay, mm-hmm. we accept the fact that, because let's be realistic, we cannot have well, the ability to make sure everyone become wealthy, but let's actually make sure that some people can be doing better first. So then, but then to ordinary people, well, during that time, yeah, some people actually were wealthier than others. And then as a result, a lot of corruption happened. So I would say that coming back to Xi Jinping, some people well, would say that it's good for Xi to focus on corruption issue. To what extent uh, isn't it time to also uh, decentralize the power a little bit to make sure that the legal system, the political system, more in line with um, democracy, even though this is actually a goal that's far away from China. But President Xi Jinping has made it quite evident that the Communist Party's ideology be upheld. He's cracked down on dissent and political opposition. Those who have crossed the line often end up in prison. Your expertise is the law. Is there such a thing as a fair trial in China? Do the courts just rubber stamp whatever Xi desires? Let's put it this way. Well, there are so many cases in China. So on average, I can give you a number on average. A judge, a Chinese judge needs to handle more than 300 cases per year. So so then because of this heavy caseload, if you look at the actual, the reality, it's not possible for interference happening in every single case. However, to be very clear, if 
Well, this is a very political case, a sensitive case. Yes. Well, there is actually a mechanism to actually interfere with the process. But then the most important thing is actually to what extent? Okay, what are the numbers? So mm -hmm. what we see is, well, from my point of view as a legal scholar, our hope is actually, well, we, we have actually cases, actually standard deviation, three standard deviations away from the mean. Some are positive, some are very negative. My point of view is that just make sure that the overall mean keeps improving so that more and more ordinary people can experience justice in the Chinese legal system. May the, the U.S. and China are two very diametrically opposed countries. Uh, we have two systems, but I would hope there really is one goal. How do we create the best life that we can for our two peoples? How can we mutually build the strongest societies to take care of our children who are, are growing into adulthood and they need education, they need employment? How do we take care of our older people who have worked their entire lives to build the countries that exist today? Is there a way forward? Well, in terms of, well, I cannot agree with you more because I'm also a mother of two children. And mm -hmm. then in terms of actually protection of minors and taking care of children, I have to say one thing perhaps United States can do. And, and this area is actually particularly well done by China. It's actually protection of minors to really actually make it difficult for minors to access to certain problematic websites. Now, would the United States be ready to take that position because there will be another voice saying that, well, should not have any censorship. But then, well, there is a line to draw. But overall, okay, so my uh, protection of minors, and this is an area that actually I, I believe that both sides can talk because uh, these people are our future, okay? Mm -hmm. And then, well, to make sure that they have good environment, they have something to look forward to, make sure that they well well that will be clean environment to make sure that they can enjoy the environment but in addition to that make sure that they have the education and this is one thing i think uh, in terms of education one thing actually united states should be proud of if you ask ordinary chinese people they still look up to the education well high level education in particular in the united states so they mm -hmm. still actually want no matter how hard it is, how financially burdensome it could be. They still try the best to send their children to uh, learn from American professors. I, I And that's the reason why I don't think that United States should actually impose, due to various concerns, restrict access to education well, opportunities. They should actually, because when young people meet with each other, that level of understanding and that friendship will last forever. Another thing about young people, uh, th there has to be meaningful work for them in the future, because with uh, artificial intelligence, many, many, many jobs could just disappear. There's a real fear of that in this country. I would imagine the same thing holds true in China. So how do we develop the next set of jobs, the next employment opportunities for both of our people. It sounds like, Jim, you just identified a common enemy, okay, facing both United States and China. Yeah. All right. AI. Exactly. <laughs> AI presents a very critical issue that both countries can work together. And, uh, and this is real. Um, so, well, especially for uh, China, they have to learn to face the situation that their population is actually decreasing, okay? So then how can they make sure that, well, the economy can continue to prosper and also while, while the young people have jobs because there have been concerns about a high unemployment rate among the young people. Perhaps we need to actually find some, find more international opportunities for these young minds to actually share the experience, to find solutions to problems that actually they face together. May, this is a discussion that knows no end, but we are out of time for today. But I, the story will evolve and I hope we can discuss it further in the future. One last question though, how do you see the relationship between the US and China playing out, let's say, over the next decade. We're 2023, almost 2024. Let's just say 2035. How do you see the relationship between China and America? You know, one thing I'm very, op I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm always actually optimistic. 
But I、uh, understand that one thing is actually I always emphasize. I've been in the United States well for thirty years, and I have done a lot of work、um, in mainland China. I like the people in these two countries a lot because both actually, even though we may well they they may have. Uh, some different values, right? But then, in general, they work hard. They're reasonable. They have good values. They're honest, and so so that's why I maintain my optimism, and I believe that if they can work together, well, to solve the issues that we just identify,、mm-hmm. and then to build more understanding, then they should actually have a stronger basis. To deal with tougher issues, so my advice to both people is actually is don't let politics push them apart. Imagine the two most powerful countries on earth sharing technology, sharing education, sharing developments in transportation, sharing new ways of of food production, and, and on and on and on. If we could work together, could probably solve a multitude of the world's problems and save ourselves from this climate disaster that's occurring around us today. Absolutely, I can't agree with you more, Jim. Well, let's just hope that it happens. May, as I said, there's、uh, so much to discuss. We must continue this dialogue and have you on in the future. Your insights are invaluable. That was、uh, Dr. May Getchlik, a China law and policy expert, the founder and CEO at Sinotox, which you can read at sinotox.com. That's S I N O. T A L K S, all one word. dot com, and she is the former director of Stanford University's China Guiding Cases Project. Thanks again, May. Thanks so much, Jim. And I'm Jim Paymar, and you have been listening to the Big Shift, available wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening today, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Big Shift. It's coming soon. 